There's a cat over here. There's a cat over there. And the wrong one died. And the wrong one died. Welcome to The Wrong Cat Died, the podcast breakdown of the cat catastrophe. I'm your host, Mike Abrams, and today we have another amazing guest. You hopefully have been able to check out her one-woman show, Walking with Bubbles, which is currently at the MRT in New York. But before that, she was Grizabelle on multiple productions of Cats, including the original Broadway production and the 2016 Broadway revival. So welcome, Jessica Hindi, and thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. I always love talking to Grizabellas because my thesis statement is <laughs> anti-Grizabella, and it always makes it really kind of fun, but also... Um, it's, it's fun to see performances from Grizabella's and I know you've got to do it in multiple situations. Mm -hmm. My first question is always, did you see the 1998 movie, but you started in the U S tour like months before that came out. So what was your introduction to cats before you went on tour? Um, my introduction was to cats was when I took piano lessons as a kid and it was the memory was the first time I ever learned how to play on the piano. Wow. Um, and so that was the first introduction. So I just have always loved that song, but I never knew what it was. And then when I was, um, you know, really maybe in grade school, maybe a freshman in high school, um, I saw the tour come through um, Cincinnati, Ohio. And, you know, at intermission, you got to go up on stage and older Deuteronomy is just sitting there. And so my mom and I went up on stage and I just turned around in the theater in Cincinnati, Ohio Music Hall where, um, where it was playing. And I saw that perspective of what it's like to be on a grand stage rather than like a high school gym stage or something. And it just <gasps> took my breath away. And... Um, that really just made me love the show even more because it that show got me onto stage. You know what I mean? Was that one of the first ones you'd seen at that theater or had you been to other stuff and this is just like a memorable one from childhood? Um, like I saw the Nutcracker at that theater. I mean, my parents always took us to shows, um, but I'd never been on a grand, big, legitimate stage like that until wow. I saw Cat. Yeah. yeah, that's a cool part of the show because, you know, you get that intermission and go up and now it's like take a selfie and, you know, you get to get right. your phone. But but it is, a, yeah, it's your first chance to kind of turn around and, and see yeah. the whole crowd still there. And I love hearing, too, because I talked to so many performers who have been on the show and a lot are dancers. And I, as a not a dancer or a singer, but I, my mom's a music teacher and a piano teacher. And mm. memory is something I had heard. It was the only thing I knew about cats going mm -hmm. in. And so it's kind of a... It's cool to hear you say that before you even saw it, you learned memory on the piano. And then yeah. that's kind of the the real introduction. So you go on tour. You're part of the Cats Chorus. You're covering for Isabella. Uh -huh. What is like, how is that first introduction of being the other side of it, especially the rehearsal process and learning this kind of chaotic story? Like, what is, what do they tell you? What was that professional experience like? Um. Well, when I went on tour, so that was like my first, my first life of mm -hmm. being a cat. Um, you know, it, it was hyper focused on being really um, per perfect at the, uh, the the songs because everyone on stage is working their tail off, dancing and singing at the same time. So they really needed a boost of vocals of, because the music is difficult. It's as challenge, challenging as the dancing is. Um, it's, it's a big sing. Yeah. Um, and it's sung the entire show. Like there's, there's only the ball really that, that you get to just only dance, you know, everything else there's singing and dancing. Um, so, uh, it was very hyper-focused on making sure that all of our harmonies were tight and that our diction was well. Uh, even though we're singing poetry, we still have to get the, the words across to the audience so that they can like make up some story in their head of what's going on. But so that was like step one. And I didn't, I came in as a replacement. So I didn't like start rehearsals with everyone. But while I was on, 
rehearsals, we had, or in rehearsals, we had, um, oh my God, his name is fleeing from my brain. David, can't remember. He was from London. He came over and we had our first kitty cat class where we were meowing and learning to be cats on stage. And he took it very seriously, which kind of gave us all permission um, to as well take it very seriously. Because if, if we don't believe that we are cats, then the audience will never believe that. And the audience will never get that opportunity to like dive into the world and go there. <laughs> because if we're commenting on, oh yeah, we're a cat, then it's just, it doesn't work. It, we have to be the cat. Yeah, it's a it's a true character. Like you have mm-hmm. to be almost method acting your way through because there's so many emotions that are built on it. And then it's also, it's a, it's a loose and weird story. And so it's like, you kind of have to lean into some of the poetry turned into a plot line. Um, and so the cat aspect is more of it, but yeah, you now go on. So then you make your Broadway debut as Grizabella, yes. correct? So you go from tour and this is the, the truest of all big stages at the winter garden. Yes. What is that like the, you know, that moment? Oh my gosh. So again, I was, um, do it. And I was a standby. I was in the cat's chorus singing in the booth off stage every night. And, um, one night the, uh, stage manager came to me and said, you're going to be going on next week. And I, I literally got tears in my eyes because that was my Broadway debut. My Broadway debut was on stage at the Winter Garden Theater singing memory, like one of the most iconic roles ever written in, in the musical theater catalog. Um, was my Broadway debut. And I was nervous um, even coming into the company because at that time, it was the longest running show on Broadway. So I was worried that the company was going to be really jaded and not very welcoming to me, but I was completely wrong. They were the most loving company they all loved the show. It was a very healthy theater. It was a very healthy cast. Everyone did their job. Everyone did their job well. And um, it was very supportive there. So when I made my Broadway debut, um, you know, I had Marlena Danielle, who was still in the company, playing Bomb Ballerina. I walk on stage for memory and she hisses at me and it literally <laughs> scared me. I was already scared. But it scared me and, but it was in character. It was just, I never could have dreamed it would be that. It was, it was absolutely wonderful. It's, you know, it's with the character of Grizabella being supposed to be shunned and not accepted to the end, it takes like, you know, you're all professional actors and performers, but like it takes that acting thing. And I've heard some really crazy stories about some producers, directors who have done some interesting things with Grizabella to like try to build that like, oh, us, us against Grizz mindset. But I love really? hearing, yeah, I've heard a couple. Um, but I love hearing that's like your cast just welcomes you in and then you go on and do your jobs as professionals and like can have that moment of acting of this, we don't like Grizabella. But it's it's fun to hear because I do think like, when I think about as a non-actor, as someone who doesn't do this, it's like how much into that character do you get and like of the personalities and having interviewed now 120 plus cast members of this show, it's fascinating to hear like the personalities of some of the characters kind of bleeding into the answers I get from the actual actor. And I'm like, oh, that was, that's very much how your character would answer that question. And so it is interesting to hear that, like, that didn't happen here. You had like a very welcoming, as it should be, a welcoming and loving cast that brings you in and welcomes you in, even though the minute they get on stage, they got to kind of hiss at you and shun you until they welcome you back at the end. Well, exactly. Because if, I mean, the, the, the cats are a tribe, right? They're a family. Mm-hmm. And um, Grizabella wasn't always an outcast. You know, she was it. She was the star. And something happened where she was universally shunned. Um, but there's always room for forgiveness. Mm-hmm. It, even in the most horrible situations, there's always room for forgiveness. And I think that's where this show succeeds is because audience members 
They may not know what the hell is going on at all, but they know that this one cat is shunned, but that at the end, she's brought back into the tribe and everyone can relate to that. That's that totally. moment of, of atonement and, and forgiveness, you know? Totally, totally. This is not boding well for what is going to be my final, final question. Just the way you've already explained this. I know where, where we're headed. Um, I want to ask though quickly, before we get into a little bit about the character and some of that moments of like, she was a tribe, I want to ask a couple of questions there. But you also got to do the 2016 revival yeah, with different choreography, a little bit of change. I know that you bridged Leona to Mamie as Grizabella. Mm-hmm. How much, how does that process differ when you've done a, a show and you have this, like, it's still the same show, but there are enough dif- differences to make it unique. Like, what is that experience like for you having kind of done both? Um, it was very interesting. Um, I would say there was some struggle between, let's just say, the old guard and the new guard <laughs> of CAD. Um, Andy really wanted to bring the show into the present landscape of musical theater. And he had a lot of walls and he got a lot of no's, but he was given the space to try out a lot of choreography. And there was a lot of choreography that was absolutely breathtaking and a lot of storytelling that was absolutely spectacular that only saw the light of day in the rehearsal room um because the original creators wanted more they they kind of said they wanted it to be updated but when it came down to it they i don't think they were quite ready to really hand over their baby which i can understand you know it brought them success for many decades um but they weren't quite ready to let it sort of evolve. Um, so as a cast, it was hard in that we had to learn a lot of things and then we had to leave leave them and then go back mm-hmm. to... But Andy was able to get in enough new choreography, I think, that it gave it sort of a splash of... Um, relevancy that it sort of needed yeah it's so interesting to hear you say this because i didn't see any production prior to 2016 so i didn't have the like i'm not in the old guard and there's a group of fans that the original is it and nothing else sure no changes and and that sure i also kind of have thought a little bit about i've talked to when they did the hip-hop tugger which was the last kind of big change they made that was fairly did not land as well. And so I do wonder if there is some of this, like the last big modernization change they tried did not land well. Here's now another version of it that there's a little bit of protection. But my familiarity is with just a new version and Andy's, you know, extremely well, you know, um, well-regarded and talented and all this stuff. So it is fascinating to hear it from the fan perspective too. Sure. How there is a big thing, but from the actor side, it is, you know, it's, it's interesting to hear from you that you tried a lot of things in rehearsal and had to find that balance of what made it on stage to still kind of honor the original, but still make enough tweaks. And as someone who didn't know much, I thought it was, I loved the 2016 version. I thought it was great. So, um, but it, it is, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting to me. It's been 40 something years. So there's a lot of, you know, there's, yeah. there's discourse across all of it. Sure. Yeah. So let's talk about your Grisabella theories here, you know, Okay. where do you think she goes when she leaves? Like, what is, did you have to tell yourself a backstory before you come back out and sing memory of like why you were gone and to bring that back to stage? Like how much of that goes into your acting and how much did you think about over these years of getting to do this show that of here's what was Grisabella's like, not just the 15 minutes you get of her on stage. Here's everything else you need. So, Okay, I'll ask, I'll answer your first question first, which was, where do you think she goes? I, I think she goes to some sort of afterlife and I think she gets to be reborn. Sorry, let me, let me rephrase that. Where do you okay. think she goes before she comes back to memory? Cause she like, oh. was part of the tribe and like shunned. Yeah. And comes back, right? 
Yeah. I think she goes down like a path of destruction. Okay. I think she sort of uh, probably got some success, got some, um, got like a bit on on a high horse maybe. Mm -hmm. And she was probably universally loved by her tribe. And she probably uh, liked the power. And she probably got drunk on the power and started acting uh, destructively to the people that loved her and herself. And she probably did some things that were like horrible, you know, Mm. and she, she, they, they probably, the cats probably were like, enough, you're a mess. Get out of here. Go clean up your life. One thing that hasn't been said, but that you just described to me, and I've just thought of it now, and which is crazy, because anytime I have a new thought, it kind of blows my mind at this point in doing this podcast. But it seems like Grizabella was the, you had a you had a band, and she was the one who wanted to go out on her solo career, but it didn't work. Yeah, I mean, maybe. Yeah, I can see that. I, I just, I really see what the way I take the character is that um, she had deep bonds. She had, you know, family in that tribe. And I think she like, I think she did some people wrong. I think she hurt some people and I think she was destructive. And I think like they probably said, get the hell out of here. Like you are a bad person now. You're a bad cat. You're a bad cat. Yeah. Like, and so then she probably did say, well, I'm going to do this on my own. And then she couldn't. And then she, and that's why she comes back. Did you think about any, um, you know, you said family and I know cats is like, it's, it's the family tree's loose. So there's no like real way to answer that. But did you think about like, this was my daughter, this moment with Victoria or my sister, Bomb Ballerina? Like, did you go through any of those moments as you're doing this? Or is this something that you kind of just, uh, you create over time? I think it's, I think it honestly, because I've done several productions and several different castmates, I think it depends on who you're working with. Um, I think there always is a bond between uh, Grizabella and Victoria. I don't know. Sometimes I feel like it's a daughter thing. Sometimes I feel like it, Victoria represents um, like forgiveness. She, she represents an emotion that she is showing to the tribe that she can show everyone with that touch. Um, that we all can, we all can get there. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because everyone likes to like have like a set pat way of like, you know, Strap and Grizabella were together and now they're not. And I don't know if it's that, like, I almost think like they could be brother and sister, you know, that it, it might not even be that they were a couple and they had, uh, kittens. Um, I just see it as a family and I, it depends on who I'm working with. That's the beauty of cats where you find those like eye, eye gazes that you lock because it can be different people yeah. or different cats. It's fascinating because it's it's why this, I think I'm able to still do so many episodes is that there is no consistent answer and yeah. every fan has an opinion. Sure, it. and I've I've created some of that discourse on accident on social media by posting something, and someone's like, "Oh no, Bombalerian and Demeter are are definitely sisters," and I'm like, oh, "I don't." A lot of people think they're not sisters, and then there's a fifty fifty split when you vote it out, and so it is. I think the because so much of it is dancing, staging, and then the interactions that you all have. To your point of who is who are you with on stage at that moment? is what creates those. And when you have, again, 40 years of this, there's a different version of this happening so many different times. So Absolutely, because like the point is to tell the story. I mean, T.S. Eliot wrote these poems for his nieces and nephews to like give them something to do while the adults could like do adult things. You know, there was no television or, you know, so he, he like made these stories for them. So they don't necessarily connect but we made them connect Mm -hmm. you know um and that's our job as actors to tell the story to find those connections so that the audience can i mean isn't that so great about cats like there's so many different theories 
that just means that the story is just like timeless and there's so much that can be mined from it. Yeah, I've compared it a little bit to like, I think the part that I like is that it's almost Harry Potter-ish and that a world was created. And Absolutely. in that world, there's yeah. a lot of ways you can go. You can add in a new character if you needed to and you could write it. That's why there's so much fan fiction, honestly. And yeah. there's a Tumblr that does interactions together because mm -hmm. this really creative, unique tribe was built and it, they didn't say a lot of the stuff out loud. The 2019 movie tried to add some of that stuff. But like ultimately, there isn't this like neat and tidy storyline. It's one or two, mo like it's moments and then there's an ending. But it is because it's poems and it was just entertainment and they weave together beautiful music and dancing to, to create this thing. And it's why the, everyone who dislikes it, they can't give a real answer on why they dislike it. It's just like not their cup of tea and yeah. that's okay. But it's, it's a fascinating difference. We're going to take a quick break and then we'll be back for more of The Wrong Cat Died. I want to pivot. This is going to be a hard pivot because yeah. it's going to be hard to go from, from Cats to Walking with Bubbles because they're very different shows. But I got to see it this past weekend. Um, an incredible performance. Thank you. I want to just the first thing I want to ask is how did you decide to tackle the topic? knowing that it's such a personal story it's about you know your your life with mm -hmm. your kid and and everything going on that surrounds that um it's very emotional how did you decide that this was like the the one woman show topic you wanted to to do i don't know i don't think i just decided it just sort of happened and actually the first version i wrote was a multi-character um and i sort of gave well i didn't sort of give i gave it to um my close circle and had them read it and every single person said to me separately you've written a one person show get rid of this other character and i was like oh no 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 i can't do a one person show and um they're like no you wrote it you, like you can do this so then i started thinking like do i want to do this like it's a it's a it's a big topic mm -hmm. it's like there's a lot of um impactful issues that I am writing about. And I thought I became an actress because I have this gift of being able to tell a story. And I think anyone in the arts has this gift and this calling to create these worlds where the audience member can kind of suspend their own life and go to, into these worlds and be touched or learn something new or have sudden questions that then they leave the theater and they can ask these questions or incorporate what they, they've seen into their own lives. And so I just decided that I feel like there's a bigger conversation that needs to be happening with mental illness, single parenting, um, and I thought, I have a story to tell. And if I tell my story, then perhaps there will be a bigger conversation about it. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's why I decided to. Yeah, well, you definitely do it. I, I saw it this, this past weekend and I immediately went with the friend I went with and we went two doors down and had a drink and had a long conversation about what we watched. That's and the goal. Oh my gosh, that makes me so happy to hear that. That's the goal. It's like when you go to a movie and you leave the movie and you're like, we need to go have a drink. We had to do debrief. Yes, we need to debrief yes. on this. I love um, it. Yeah. So you've done that uh, very well. And honestly, I saw every group leaving the theater doing very similar things. Of like, there was another group next to us that I saw were sitting behind us. And so That's you've done great. that. I, you know, I, I'm fascinated. I hope people are going to get a chance to go see it. This will come out. There'll still be a couple of weeks left of you doing it. I, I'm curious about, it's such an emotional and I'm assuming draining performance. How do you prepare yourself to do that, especially when you do it twice a day? Doing it twice a day is difficult. Um, and I will tell you, I get this question a lot. Um, some people are worried that um, I'm still living in the trauma of it all. And what I tell everyone is that I did go through trauma for sure. Um, it's still in my body, but I am not being damaged by it anymore. Enough time has passed and enough healing has passed where I can touch on it. I can remember the emotion. I can have the emotion, but it doesn't, it doesn't over, it doesn't traumatize me all over again. Mm -hmm. um, 
So what I do to prepare for it is I, I take better care for myself right now than I ever have in my whole life. I go to bed early. I'm eating really well. I'm not drinking because it does take a toll on my body um, more than I thought it would. But I'm able to leave it on stage. I don't leave the theater and feel like I'm emotionally drained. I'm tired because it's a marathon of a show, but I'm not, I don't come home and feel like I have to cry. I, it's energizing in, in a way, um, even though it is exhausting, but it, I, I know that I'm doing it correctly um, because I'm not like, oh God, I need to go have a therapy session now because like it's bringing up old stuff. It's not bringing up old stuff. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating to me as again, not a performer to, to do just to do a 90 minute one woman show mm -hmm. is in itself a physical feat. And it's, I mean, it takes a lot of effort and energy to be able to, you're carrying, I mean, we're only looking at you the whole time. You've got great musicians behind you, but it is yeah. you. And then you add in your content and the topics and the emotional yeah. history of that. And it's just like, again, we walked out and, and, and debriefed, um, which I'm glad to hear that that's what you were looking for. Cause I think that that's, I think that's definitely what you achieved. Oh, thank you. I, I was one. It is what I'm looking for. What would you say to someone that's going to be, I have plenty of listeners in New York. And so if, you know, if they're going to come see you here in the next couple of weeks, what should they expect to going in? Like, how would you give them a, here's what you're coming to see. Um, I think you're, what you need to expect is that you're seeing a true story Prefer, performed by uh, the woman who lived it and she wrote it. And it's a frank conversation about untreated mental illness and how I walk through that with my son to the other side and sort of realize that we can have a good life even though we have experienced trauma. And I will say it is a heavy subject, but there's also... Uh, levity. There's, there's humor. Um, I, I, I try to, you know, when like you're talking to a really good friend and you're telling them about your horrible day and it is a horrible day, but then like something funny happens and it's just a yeah. part of the day, but yeah. it's, it sort of lightens it up. I try to, I tried to write that into the script because when you're seeing something really, um, emotional, there needs to be breath in in that storytelling so that the story is entertaining and um not just too heavy yeah you know yeah there's a little bit of laughing and crying like there's got to be a mix yeah. of both um, yeah and I, yeah you definitely achieved that and i think you found ways to make things that are relatable even if someone hasn't dealt with that mental trauma in their own personal life you there's other moments that that i'm sure people will tie to of things that happen yes. in between but well, if anybody has, gets a chance to, hasn't seen it and gets a chance to, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. It was a beautiful um, performance and story and, and really, really spectacular. So I will be linking everything. Go see it while you still can. Um, I want to end here with a couple rapid fire and uh, most important question, which is the jellical choice question. But before we get to that, if you could go on to Cats for any character for one night only forget if it's in your you know male female vocal range whatever but if you could just do one performance who would you want to go on as Ooh. oh my gosh okay i'm struggling the first two cats that came to my mind is uh mr mistopheles and bomb ballerina um both who get to sing and dance i'm not really a dancer um but mr mistopheles dance is incredible mm -hmm. and and like the 11 o'clock dance you know um but he also is like just fun throughout the show you know especially in the ball he has great moments and then when he gets that light up jacket it's just i i just love it and then bomb ballerina is present throughout the whole show uh she's a strong woman a strong cat and she has a great song and she's sexy and um i think they would be really fun to do either one of those i i agree 
I agree with both of those. I think those are two, two great answers. Who are your favorite and least favorite cats characters? Uh, well, um, obviously my favorite is Grisabella. <laughs> Duh. Um, my least favorite cat? Jeez. I, I don't have a least favorite cat. No, not Come one. On. There's not one as Grisabella that kind of like bugs you a little. Or even no. you as Jess. No. I can Do tell you. Do people answer that? Oh, yeah. Usually someone has it. It's actually fascinating to me because some people are like start with the the dislike first. Mine, I can tell you mine is. Mine's Peter. I hate Peter. Why? I just don't. I just don't like that. You got it's Gurr in your 2016 because it's Gus's character. And they uh-huh. have all, they name all these like crazy cat names. You've got Skimbleshanks and Tugger and Bistopheles. And then you've got Peter. Yeah, but I have a friend that has a dog named Steve. (laughs) I know. I have, I do have friends that have it. It makes me laugh, but I just like this show's got such creative and strange names. So, but no, people usually have, and usually it's a, if they're like their character kind of has like a little bit of like, oh, I don't really get along with that cat. It's usually that. Um, But Uh, yeah, I I do, I do get an answer most of the time. I won't press you on answering one though. Well, I don't have a cat that I dislike. I mean, that's like saying like, which shot, what, which, which of your children do you not like? I mean, I love cats. I would I be surprised. It. I know one of my best friends loves cats too, Claire Camp. And I bet you she didn't have an answer either. I think she did answer that. I have to go back. I've interviewed Claire. Claire was, Claire loves cats. Claire is, it was oh, I know. so fun. I've um, done two different productions of cats with Claire. Claire is a trip she yeah. had that's her party her party trick was telling people which cat they were and i have found that yeah. fascinating i love it it's just such a fun thing she's yeah. she's incredible i will go back i will email you when we hang up because i will go back and listen to it i'm pretty sure she answered that question i will be shocked shocked she loves cats more than i love cats i think it's going to be someone that annoyed her but not Probably. like disliked you know no one dislikes you know they're again family but you got that one. Okay, we'll go on. What about favorite song from the show? Um, when I'm not in the show, I would say, or I, let me let me amend that. When I'm in the show, my favorite song is "Moment of Happiness." Okay, I think. It is beautiful, and Grizabella sneaks out on stage and is there for that song that Old Deuteronomy sings. And I think it is such a great song. It's really deep. There's so much in that song. Um, and then uh, when I'm not, when I, so my, to sing, I think um, the opening, yeah. Jellicles. It's yeah. so fun. Jellicles are and Jellicles do. I mean, it's just a fun song. I, I agree. I, there's a, you know, I go through waves of which one is my answer to this all the time. Mm-hmm. And right now it's McCavity, but it's been Mungo Jan Apple Teaser. It's been Memory. It's been, you know, there's, there's a lot of really good just musical moments in this. Song. Yeah. Um, all right. We got to get to the most important question. And I think you're going to defend Grizabella, but I have argued that I don't think Grizabella is the right Jellicle choice. I can give you my reasonings after, but I want to hear. Are you defending Grizabella or do you have a different Jellicle choice if you get to make the uh, decision on who gets to go to the heavy set layer? I am not going to defend Grizabella. Ooh, all right. Um, I think Grizabella's welcoming back into the tribe is is her rebirth um, right there. She doesn't need to go to the heavy side layer. She I, gets to be back home. I agree completely. I think Gus should have gone to the heavy side la- layer. I love, 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 love that you picked that um, because it's rare I get a Grizabella not pick Grizabella. So thank you for bucking really? that trend. Oh yeah, very. I th- and I understand it if you have to. You I mean, go it's into great this, theater. That it's she great gets theater. To you go. go into this emotional moment multiple yeah. times. Like you're really you're you're in that, and you have to kind of almost deal with that emotional to sing it like you have to sing it with such raw emotion to begin with that you kind of sell yourself on like yeah of course it's me um but i agree with you in the sense that i think that because she comes back like she can be next year's choice 
Like, let her go next year. But wouldn't it be great if she was the choice? And then she turned to Gus and brought him up to the tire to old Deuteronomy and let let him go in her place. I, I mean, talk about that would be, I'd be done. That would be Academy Award winning moment right there. I, I that's probably my favorite answer right now is how we need to <laughs> how we need to end the show is is she's the choice and then she gives she turns around and does not go on the tire and grabs Gus and it's your turn I'm because ready to that's spend time the ultimate redemption I think that's what Grizabella would do you know because she doesn't necessarily want to go that I mean uh, what she wants is to feel loved again and exactly that's that has been my most common argument now is give her that moment but let her have it for the year like let's let her experience it we are on the exact same page yay i am glad i thought i was going to come here and have to debate and convince you to pick grizzabella you know to to get rid of your grizzabella mindset and you have exactly the argument that i've been making recently so yes i I, totally agree with you i love it and you've one upped it because you have the You've taken the actor version of it, too, and said, let's make the ending even better. She's going to yeah. step down, grab Gus, and then he's going to go. Um, we're going to work on trying to convince somebody to let us do that in a production. Wouldn't that be amazing? I, that would just be... That would be amazing. I, I In mean, fact, I'm going to work to make that happen. Please. I have been trying. Um, <laughs> Andrew Weber ignores all my messages. Um and then, no, I mean, I, I worked with the the tour, the current tour. They were so fun to test out some like cider, you know, smaller things without, of course, messing with what people are going to see. But yes, you have more pull yeah. than I do. If you can make this happen, I'm, I'm there. I will be, I'll be sitting Imagine. front and center at the audience. If you can be anywhere in the world, if you can make that happen. I mean, if anything, it would make all the news because people would be up in arms. There would, if Chris there, doesn't go. It would change again 40 years of the same ending, yeah. it, rewriting it. But that's what I'm here for. One one episode time. Grizabella is only half the votes right now on this podcast. And I keep oh, track. She's that's cool. around half. So I don't know. Is if all I'm, the other votes Gus? He's like 30 or 40%. And then you get all these like random one or two where someone's got a joke around why. Or it was their cat. And they're just like, I want it. Um, oh, wow. And that's pretty much the only answers. But yeah, yeah it's. It's about it's thirty or forty percent Gus, fifty-ish percent Grizabella, and then you know a couple other random arguments. So even people that weren't Grizabella will still say Grizabella. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay. You get some. That's Definitely get some. Um, how can people stay in touch with you? And we'll link the Walking with Bubbles ticket so if anybody can still see yes, it um, before they. But how can people stay in touch with you on social media? Um, I'm I'm still on Facebook because I'm not an in Gen Z or. Um, so I'm Jessica Handy on Facebook. I, for Twitter and Instagram, I'm at Jess Hendy. And, um, yeah, that's super easy. Amazing. I check my DMs. Um, yeah. So if you have other ways to end cats, send, send them to us. I check my DMs yes. too. So send us, send us your other versions of how we can end the show. Um, <laughs> well, thank you so much for, for coming on and sharing your story and walking with bubbles and, uh, and tell us a little bit about cats and your experiences. It was so fun. I was so glad I, I was asked. I appreciate it. Amazing. And thanks everyone else for listening to this episode of The Wrong Cat Die, the podcast breakdown of the cat's catastrophe. To follow along, you can subscribe on the podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, or right? so listen to podcasts. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at The Wrong Cat Die, or check out our website, thewrongcatdie.com. Mm-hmm.